So, here we are. Rah -rah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, Ben, you know, you, you more than a couple years ago, started <laughs> on a fundamental vision to bring wind into your utility. And I'm sure you had some fears, but tell me about how, you're, how you thought about balancing those fears and, and what you're really doing today to develop that business. Yeah, well, the, I, I think the fear thing probably would be the reliability element. And uh, I would tell you, Chris, five, ten years ago, I would have never have been comfortable with the amount of wind we'll have on our system today, much less five years uh, ago. But you know, our story, the Excel Energy story, and, and AWIA has recognized us for having more wind on our system than any other utility in the nation, as you know, for 12 years running. Um, part of that's, you know, we've got this great wind resource in our backyard. Are we going to sit there and do nothing with it? So we have been adding wind pretty steadily. Um, but, you know, the reason why I think the fuel of tomorrow is on sale today and we're buying is, is what happened with two things. One, the, the production tax credits that got extended along with some of the interpretation of safe harbor rules, not to get too technical. So that's the first thing. And the second thing was, um, and you had it on your screen, uh, I think it's a quiet story, but wind technology has steadily improved over the last decade. So last year, early last year, we started looking at coupling the, the PTC, locking in that, the credit, and thanks for your help with that, and, and um, the, the actual underlying technology, and we realized that we could add wind on our system, and even after you recover the capital cost, even if you recover uh, some of the ancillary costs and things like that to, that are associated with wind, we could save our customers billions of dollars in fuel savings. Fuel was on sale. It's on sale. We call that our steal for fuel strategy, where uh, I can invest in something that, is, if you're my customer, will save you money on your total bill by reducing your fuel costs more than offsetting any capital recovery that I receive. So let me, but let's let's transition because because we we've been focusing at the conference a lot on markets, right? And you know the whole concept of you, obviously there's a regulatory market which we deal with, but but also the energy markets. And you and I talk about energy markets a lot and what it means than capacity and baseload. Where is your belief on what a future market design should look like? Should it include capacity payments? Well, first of all, Chris, I'm going to tell you, I'm happy that I do my planning with, at a state regulated level. And I think there's a lot of merits to that. You can think much longer term. You can, I think, plan holistically. Uh, be, you got to have capacity. But when I, when I think of these markets, you know, they were designed, you know, circa 2000, yeah. right? You, do you know there was more oil fired generation back then than there was renewables? I did not know. I mean, so that's pretty amazing. Things yep. have changed a lot in less than 20 years, right? And, you know, back then you could have, I think, a more esoteric argument around, you know, do you need a capacity market or can you just, a capacity and energy market or just a pure energy market? But underlying that assumption was, Every time you, you commanded a resource, even in an energy market, there was underlying capacity associated with it. And, you know, renewables, wind, I view it from a planning capacity standpoint more of a, as a fuel. Yep. Then, and, and so you still have to have something to back it up. Now, wind's more and more dependable. Our forecasting tools are more, uh, better and better at understanding and integrating into the wind, getting the maximum value of that. But I still think you need some capacity out there. But I think wind, gets a bad rap that they are crashing baseload capacity. Okay, so talk about that a little bit about, because I mean, there's not a lot for capacity payments these days. We've seen some. Right, because there's a lot of capacity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> is demand flat? Is, should that scare us or are you okay? Uh, uh, no, I, I, I think right now everything's fine. I mean, I, obviously if you've got merchant generation, it's not fine for you and there's a lot of capital being slaughtered basically, but, um, but uh, ultimately, these markets clear, and you get into it. So the markets are working. I mean, in the sense that the the some of the some of the system has to be cleared with some maybe inefficient technologies. Yeah, I mean, I think that you've got to you've got to see some some capacity fall off, and then the question is, how do you stimulate new capacity in the future? But wind is not causing those issues. No, I think the biggest issues. I mean, I think re there's a portion of that. But if I were going to rank it, it would be the fact that we had a, a great recession and we had a lot of surplus capacity 
And then we've seen low natural gas prices, which are still basically the clearing, you know, marginal fuel. Well, they've stayed at historically low prices for a long time. You put those two combinations together, and then you throw on some of the distortions that can happen, you know, with having a, a lot of renewables in markets, and you are where you are. But I think what people want to do a lot of times, Chris, is flip those three things. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell me about, really, though, your vision and how you got comfortable in the communities, in the local communities. Because sometimes wind has some opposition. And I know you're yeah. across Texas and Colorado and Minnesota. So those are three very different states. It's, but There's a lot of, there's a cultural, there's a different perspective if you're in Minnesota or if you're sitting in Amarillo, Texas. <laughs> tell there, tell me about, though, how, they got, how you got comfortable well, selling them wind. I have a lot of little uh, tr maybe trite sayings, Chris. But w one thing I know is, uh, um, you know, um, most of our customers want a cleaner energy product, but all of them want a more affordable product. So when I look at what we have with steel for fuel, uh, it doesn't matter if it's you know wind or anything else, it, it down in, with our customers that are economically driven and think a little bit less about the environment, it's about money. Right. Well, wind is a fuel that is saving them money. Right. And you know when you show them the numbers, you show them the spreadsheets, you show them what that's going to mean to them, they get a little more excited about it. Right. But talk about, talk about that, because one of the things that you, you know, really kind of driven into my head is this concept of, you know, you don't have to sacrifice. You can decarbonize, and you can have low-cost energy. And that is kind of a winning combination for our industry. So talk about how you talk about it to your investors and then your communities. Yeah, well, I'm really excited about it, and wind does play a big part of that, because it creates that headroom for additional investments when you're lowering that total bill. I actually think that, and it's going to be regionally specific. It's going to be easier for us to do than other parts of the country, but everybody can do this. I think we can deeply reduce carbon emissions while not sacrificing reliability, not sacrificing affordability. I think part of the key guiding principles that you have to have in my seat is that, okay, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to reduce carbon in the most efficient, affordable way possible, which I think we should be doing? Or are we in love with the technology? Right. So if you, if, you, if you let carbon reduction be your goal, then you chase the technologies and the solutions that get you there in the most efficient way possible. And the good news is I think wind plays a huge role in that as one of the most efficient fuels possible we can put on the system. And, and reliability. You're, you, I mean, you, again, north to south, you're from almost in Canada, almost yeah. in Mexico. Reliability for wind, and, and what do you think about it? Well, okay, so we are in Minnesota to Texas, and most of those markets, with one notable exception, we are in larger RTOs, and they certainly help with that reliability issue. But we are also in Colorado, which is a, it's a, you know, classic, you know, just a balancing area. And uh, interesting fact, I, I think we set a world record, um, and it was either last spring or the spring before that, where we had 67% of our energy come from wind wow. in a single hour. Now, I'm not making the claim that I want to see that all the time. That's a I'm little okay difficult. With that. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we can have a conversation around that. But, but the point is, uh, no, no problems with reliability. So, this is where I, this is, by the way, this is where I like s uh, the state planning process a little right. bit better. It's not, it's not by accident. We knew we were going to have more renewables on our system, Chris. So, we started retiring some inefficient coal plants replacing that with load following gas technologies, really starting to redesign, you know, redefine what base load capacity is, what capacity is, and how that's all going to integrate together. And, you know, again, as I said before, I don't think five, ten years ago I'd be comfortable telling you that we could not sacrifice reliability when we're going to have in just five years 35 percent of our energy across all those eight states come from wind. I'm telling you, I'm very comfortable with that today. Final question, real quickly, because I think we're out of time. Somebody wants to sit in your chair 15 years from now. We talked about energy analysts last year, and I coined the phrase energy energy disruptor this year. What would the attributes or the characteristics of the woman that wants to sit in your chair be? <laughs> well, I hope it is a woman, by the way. Uh, I think you've got to have a willingness to adopt technologies at the speed of value, get out in front of the curve, uh, really listen to your, your, your customers, broadly defined. Uh, that's your regulators in our case as well, your business community, uh, your community in general. 
Uh, and then, of course, your other big constituent is your employees. And if you, if you listen and you lead and you, and you share a vision, um, you get a lot of people excited around you to execute on that vision, and uh, you can be successful. Well, anyway, I'm excited to listen to Ben Moore, but I think we're out of time, and we need to go to the next panel. But all I'd like to do is thank you for being a visionary. Thank you for spending, spending the time today. And, yeah. Keep on doing what and you Chris, do. Thanks for your work with AWIA and, and thanks for your work in the industry. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.